Good morning. This will be a confirmation of everything you've heard already. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Scott Merrill, this year's recipient of the Driehaus Prize. Scott is among the brightest stars in the firmament of classical and traditional architecture. He has an excellent eye, enhanced by deep historical knowledge of architectural composition and a sense of humor that revels in clever response to limitations. A keen understanding of the complementary rules of innovation and tradition, I was trying to decide whether to use the word invention or innovation there, and an adroit open-mindedness about style has led to the most extraordinary syntheses, perhaps not yet visible in the photos. Extraordinary syntheses of Palladio, Schinkel, Lutyens, Los, Plechnik, Wright, and even Le Corbusier. A true student of Vincent Scully, who taught us to love all architecture that is good and contributes to civic culture, Scott has perfected the act of balancing the irreconcilable, or as he said, the intractable. Scott leads Merrill Pastor Colgan, a practice that has produced consistently beautiful buildings and places that embellish nature, elevate community spirit, please countless users and admirers, and inspire offspring. Their buildings look as if they belong, they age well, they have graceful floor plans, they make their users feel comfortable, they intrigue for their strength of character. And they have managed to convince design juries to give the National AIA Award of Excellence to traditional buildings. Three times to this one firm, including Scott's first project as a sole practitioner, the seaside honeymoon cottages that you just saw. Imagine having to top your own first act, a challenge taken on with aplomb, with recurring recognition for, among others, the Windsor Village Center, which is a stage set, and the Fort Pierce Federal Courthouse, a commission won competitively in the US GSA Design Excellence Program, credited with transforming its city. Scott makes it all look easy, but he does not shy from the profession's heavy lifting. The day-to-day -day production of construction documents, site inspections, and design review. His master plan for the University of Miami School of Architecture is a tour de force of campus plan research and alternate scenario studies. This is missionary work, subject to the potentially overwhelming forces of others' lack of caring and ignorance, as the architect seeks to overcome all the odds stocked, stacked against excellence in the built environment. Scott has been fighting the good fight producing victory after victory with beautiful, appropriate, inspiring, beloved buildings. Their appeal has been invaluable in the acceptance and spread of new urban and smart growth ideals in new and old communities. The leading architect of the new urbanism, Scott has played the role of town architect for its most influential new communities, guiding the work of many architects to make these memorable places. In that role, he has exhibited the admirable skill of writing as well as he designs. You got a small hint of that in his words earlier today. He writes clearly, concisely, and with elegance. An unusual balance of high-level right brain and left brain development. His critiques of others' uninspired designs are masterful. Forthright criticism and suggestions in reports that are worthy of literature. I presume that Zoanne is filing them all. His leadership inarguable, Scott has enjoyed supporting others too, collaborating with Leon Creer for the Great Hall at Windsor and at the UM School of Architecture. And his friendship with the late Charles Barrett encouraged Charles' development as a classicist. They share a legacy in vignettes and projects that have come alive in new communities across the country. Upon the broader field of global practice, Scott's ability to interpret history and culture illuminates a future for architectural traditions in places where others may not yet have thought of this, in the Caribbean, Central and South America, and the Arabian Peninsula. 
He has managed this breadth of reach, even while eschewing the popular centers of architectural culture making a comfortable home for his family a priority. And with Zoanne's courageous partnership, Scott early on chose to run his practice out of small town Florida. As you have seen, that choice clearly has not diminished his impact and likely encouraged the good cheer and focus of the firm, as well as given Will and Ella the calm impetus for promising careers of their own. In summary, Scott is an exemplar of the best the profession of architecture has to, has to offer. His work should be studied closely by students, an architect of the present to learn from. To those students in the room, I might suggest that the next spring break, you should go south to look for Merrill Pastor Colgan buildings. Scott shows us that the foundation of the past has been recovered and that it is possible to set new foundations for our time and the future with work that can truly be called an architecture of humanism. So if we were in the South Bend, Michael would tell me what it was that I wanted to talk about today. <laughs> um, I guess out of deference, he has said instead that I can speak about anything. My notes here start with uh, Driehaus Award version number nine. And you don't write nine versions of a talk if the um, first eight are masterpieces. <laughs> so, um, and it's not like this one's that much better. I sort of ran out the clock and I have to give this one. But it is different in one regard. It's a little bit more from my heart uh, than my head and I hope you can handle a little bit of sentimentality, and I hope it's not too personal. Uh, it's basically an extended acknowledgement of my debts. I'd like to thank Richard and the University of Notre Dame towards the end of the remarks, and I would just like to say to Javier that I'm very proud to share the stage with your father and you today as well. All right, thank you first of all to um, those of you who lend young architects a hand up. In 1987, Andres came through the offices in Washington of his classmates, Heather Cass and Pat Pinnell, for whom, I'm, for whom I worked. I was three years out of school. And Heather said, as I think they said in the film, that um, uh, I, uh, she had said to Andres, um, Scott wants to design buildings at Seaside, much as you might say of a kid that he wants to be an astronaut. And a few months later, I was designing buildings at Seaside. And this is the charming thing of being around Liz and Andreas and in their orbit. And uh, they did similar things for a remarkable number of people. And I hope you understand that. So Robert Davis, in turn, gave someone who had never built anything on their own before 200 feet of the most beautiful beachfront in all of Florida. Robert also did these things for innumerable architects. The Westons as well in Vero Beach did the same thing. And you can only remark on how lucky we were to be around people who were so generous. I would also like to thank those who inspire us. Leon Kerr happened to be a neighbor when we were living in Seaside. Someone asked, once asked a singer-songwriter that I was fond of at one point why he didn't write more songs. And he said, um, Buddy Holly's already written all of them. And, you know, it's a clever line, but it's a little bit lame. And I have done more riffs on Leo's work than you can count. And it has also taught me more about the nature of an elastic tradition than I could have ever learned secondhand. The right kinds of ideas gives you plenty of room to learn from others and still make your own way. When Seaside was just getting started, the buildings along 30A were built with pine siding, which tended to rot in the steamy subtropical heat. They were trimmed with pressure-treated southern yellow pine, which, when it shrank, cracked and pulled apart. And they were fastened with galvanized nails, which were fine unless you struck them with a hammer. <laughs> so I would like to say thanks to the Cajun contractors like Benoit Laurent and Mark Bro 
who in the mid 80s fled the oil glut depression in Texas and Louisiana, where there was, by the way, a great building tradition. And we are so grateful that they came to a place like Walton County, which at that time had an insufficient uh, building tradition. So I would like to extend th thanks to the, all those who built Seaside. Uh, Will and Ella, your name has come up frequently. I'm glad you can be here today. And Zoanne, I would just like to thank you for your sacrifices, which are numerous and unremarked upon. George Pastor and David Colgan, um, I would like to acknowledge your immense talents, of course, but I would also like to thank you for deflecting you know, the occasional frustrations of practice into humor. And I would also like to thank you for turning work into a great source of pleasure and pride. And I would like to thank a small army of Notre Dame graduates, both current and past. And I think they're here from Panama, LA, Seattle, Carson City, um, Denver, Boulder, Madison, Wisconsin, Chicago, Chicago, Lansing, Boston, New York, New York, Long Island, uh, Augusta, uh, Spartanburg, South Carolina, and Tampa, I, th I think. Um, it's interesting because they almost all come to us when they're 23 years of age, and they're great already. But um, by the time they're 24 or 25 years old, they become aware of the fact that they're amazing, or they're capable of just the most remarkable and amazing things. And they start to carry themselves just a little bit differently than they did when they first arrived. And I don't know if they notice this of, of themselves or not, but I certainly notice. And helping to guide this transformation is one of the great pleasures of practice. And I guess I would like to thank the Driehaus jury in part for acknowledging the teaching occurs in offices and well after graduation as well. Thank you as well to those who continue to instruct and encourage you all throughout your life. When the Seaside Chapel was recently completed, I was inside with Andreas, and he pointed up to a riffle of offsets, which is sort of up near where the wall, upper wall met the ceiling. And it was one of those things that you sort of do for your own pl private pleasure. And he pointed up and he said, uh, don't think I don't notice. And I would just like to say to those who all have people in their lives who encourage them throughout, that uh, we're all grateful for the fact that you notice and for the fact that you point up. I would also like to acknowledge the um, bounty and almost unimaginable richness of this country's building traditions, which we seem to have beaten to death already. But from an early age, when my school teacher parents showed me everything from Monticello, which really didn't impress me that much when I was seven years old, to uh, places like Mesa Verity, which really did impress me when I was seven years old. These family trips were sort of a bridge to the peripatetic years that Jeffrey had referred to. They were a bridge to dragging Zoan to remote spring towns in Virginia and to the writings of Vincent Scully, who was first a teacher and then later a friend. So I loved the tobacco barns outside the Hartford Airport, but I also loved the warehouses in Richmond as well. I loved the Pueblos at Taos and the sod houses in Nebraska. I loved the corn cribs and the grain elevators and the grapefruit sorters and the dog trots and the shotguns in the side yards and the Shaker settlements at Mount Pleasant, Kentucky and the Quaker buildings in Nantucket alike. I loved the Grange halls and the pool halls and the road houses and I loved the gossamer metal bridges that were on the blue highways and I loved the, the white congregational churches of New England which were, as Scully might have said, vertical with rectitude and prosperity. So we talked about this a little bit earlier, but if you look at vernacular buildings, there you learn at least two things. First of all, that there's a type of universalism that's based on reason. Grain elevators and corn cribs and grapefruit sorters from Saskatchewan to Vero Beach to Galicia all look similar, remarkably similar in certain ways. And you kind of marvel at the unlikelihood that people in remote locations came up with such similar solutions independently. But you also see things that are endearingly odd that could only have sprung up out of certain soils and climates and skills and materials and cultures 
and you're incredibly grateful that travel still rewards you with these peculiar differences. I would like to acknowledge the influence on me of New England towns. My wife is from Vermont and it stopped growing in 1840, so you can still see what a state is like before our profession organized. There was always a common or a green. There were a limited number of building types. They had somehow been refined to their essential qualities and they still admitted of a kind of narrow but very satisfying range of refinement. There was restraint on the high end and therefore there was correspondingly more dignity on the low end. And so the dorms at Middlebury or Hanover looked an awful lot like mills. And every building contributed to the town. Beauty was graded on a pretty forgiving curve. Repetition was ennobled rather than stigmatized. Recurring problems were more important than, this, than uh, singular ones. And these towns are sort of a rebuke, I think, for our overly narrow professional focus on the most glamorous building types, the most refined forms, the most fleeting formal preoccupations, the most gratuitous invention, and the highest cost of entry. I would also single out the Greek Revival, which for a brief time seemed to have swept everything before it. Would single it out as a good example of a just tradition. A few people could actually afford to build a temple with freestanding ionic columns, and some houses in these New England towns might turn the same old gable end of a classic cottage 90 degrees so that it faced the street and affected some kind of simple pediment. But the language was also remarkable for the effectiveness, for its effectiveness at every level of detail and sophistication and cost. The most indelible image for me was of a farmer on a road outside of town, nailing what must have been little more than a wide corner board to a classic cottage with a plain frieze beneath the eaves and a box cornice formed simply and rationally by the rafters. And this man, who I assume his life was almost certainly a pretty hard life, could still think of himself as participating in the same noble tradition as the Ionic Temple in town. And I saw hundreds of these farmhouses. It was remarkable and it was touching and it was a rebuke to our modern lack of confidence in broad accessible traditions. So as we organized ourselves as a profession, we would present these same beautiful laconic towns with a parade of increasingly elaborate formal preoccupations and the ever-widening gap between the high buildings and the low buildings was more or less institutionalized, not least because our value as professionals is pretty much predicated on this gap being readily obvious. And so the aspirations of the farmer with the plain wide corner boards came to seem a little bit puny and insignificant and something I think important was lost. A just tradition has to bring as many people as possible along with it, and especially that farmer who will send his kids to a two-room Carnegie library so that their world can be just a little bit bigger than his is. So I'd like to acknowledge the founders of the CNU as well because they taught me worldliness. In school, we all talked about enlightened clients, by which I guess we meant people who were discerning enough to see how noble our intentions were. We were dismissive of our dean because he worked with developers. And for us, it would just be good guys working with good guys. The thing is, this might not be the best way to prepare for the inelegant scrum of the market or the unruly passions of the um, public hearing. In our minds, we sort of all picture the great things we will do if we're only given enough freedom and the right clients. Freedom's always a little bit more subtle than we think it is. And you can't ask for the benefits of freedom without preparing for its more unseemly side. Freedom is often gray brute commerce in bright and disarming colors. And it can just as easily explain the dispiriting strip at the edge of every beautiful town as it can the amazing projects in the magazines. And so I think we need ideas about freedom that are more helpful than invisible hands and creative classes. When I was starting my own wobbly practice, two of my heroes were Andrew Thomas, a self-taught New York architect, and, and Carol Willis, who is an uh, architectural historian who I think started in Chicago. You can read about Andrew Thomas in Richard Plunge's terrific book on New York housing. You can read about it in Bob Stern's New York 1930. 40 years after the first Tenement Reform Act, 
Thomas figured out a way to reduce their site coverage, to simplify their shapes, to reduce their construction costs, to maintain the investor's margins, to increase daylight and circulation for tenants. And in losing a tenement housing design competition in 1919, he also advanced housing reform by aligning the interests of tenants and investors. And this is kind of what I mean by worldliness. Carol Willis wrote a remarkable article on New York on Chicago skyscrapers, which is sort of a wonks feast of leasable space, office module sizes, optimal structural bays, maximum distances from outside walls, maximum ceiling heights, maximum operable window sizes, and ideal foot candles. And what was interesting to me about the way Carol Willis wrote about architecture is that while everyone else was talking about the uh, technology, the steel frame or the elevators, Willis's piece more or less focused on the overlap between zoning laws, investors' interests, and the workers' interests, the sweet spot of the building type, where the architect was sort of working the edges of things, of these large unruly forces, and the tenant was the measure of a building's success. The CNU really taught me to see the faint spark of nobility in someone I might have thought coarse or unremarkable when I was in school. Andres Dewani said some years ago that developers were the Medici's of our century. He was not being credulous about developers' natures. He was saying that the land, re land, reform use, the land reforms that he and Liz wanted couldn't rest so exclusively on noble intentions. He meant that there are not enough good clients in the sense that we usually meant it in school to make a world out of. And so we work hard with people who we might not have thought of capable of greatness because they are probably capable of good. And because if we don't work with them, they're certainly capable of great harm. We are complicated contraptions, vexing, frustrating, noble, coarse, fascinating, and about equal measure. But if you love the world enough, you will meet it on its own terms because it will not meet you on the terms of your choosing. So what did Le Corbusier famously say in that great moment of grace upon visiting Pessac, where residents had defiled his pure white buildings with their bright colors and their inelegant humanity? He said, you know that life is always right and the architect is, it is the architect who is wrong. I want to thank Richard Driehaus again for having supported those who in turn have supported the rest of us and for giving us a chance to gather and celebrate in such settings. Like several of the laureates, I practice in relative isolation and I'm really grateful that, for the chance to feel like I'm part of something that's bigger than our own paltry and sort of isolated efforts. Finally, I would like to thank Michael and Notre Dame. As I said last night, we started hiring Notre Dame students in 1994. We have hired from there consistently. And we have a number of uh, Notre Dame grads in our firm right now. And given the fact that we practice in Florida, I think this is a remarkable uh, statistic. I also know that Notre Dame students, with Notre Dame students, there's a fundamental sympathy for what our firm is interested in, in urban design, in the effective use of land, the humane organization of buildings, a broad impact at all levels of costs. Notre Dame students temper civic virtue with a pretty solid appraisal of reality. They're nice, decent, and smart people. They are good, they want to be good, and they want to do good. So when I go to a student jury in Bond Hall, as I have for some years, it's an opportunity for, for me to lift my head out of the muck of practice and to see the thesis projects of students who are working in their own hometowns trying to repair the towns that they love. And I have to admit that I feel a tinge of guilt that I'm learning more from them than they are from me. And I would like to say to the students, may you enjoy the support and the encouragement so generously afforded me uh, even to this incredibly gratifying day. Thank you. I would like to present it. Careful. Sure. Right. Thank you.